Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you here. My name is Helmut Katzgraber. I'm Global Practice Lead for Quantum in Professional Services at AWS, and I lead the Amazon Quantum Solutions Lab. Today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how we're looking at applications, real-world problems, through quantum technologies, and in some cases, how we're taking these proof of concepts, or POCs, into production. And so in this, give or take, 45, 50 minutes, I'll first give you an overview of quantum efforts at AWS. I'll tell you a little bit about hype versus reality. In my opinion, this is a large problem that the community actually faces, where there's many claims made in the press that unfortunately do not correlate well with what we actually do see in the labs. I'll tell you about the quantum solutions lab that I lead, and then I'll show you how we take POCs to production. Finally, I'll end, the, and I'll, I'll end with a phenomenal collaboration that we had with the BMW group, where we launched a crowd science challenge. We took problems from their production plant and engaged the brightest minds to see how we can find solutions. But first and foremost, what is quantum computing? And this is where it gets iffy, because you hear a lot in the press. Simply put, it's a new paradigm of solving some of the world's most challenging problems. Okay? And the important thing is that quantum devices leverage the laws of physics. So they're intrinsically physical machines designed by physicists to solve physics problems. However, it so happens that physics can allow you to look at problems in industry from a very different angle, ways that nobody thought of before. And because of that, you can potentially solve some of the most challenging problems. So you'll be able to solve some problems in very novel ways. Everybody has heard of Shor's algorithm for, for example, uh, factoring numbers. But there's also more interesting algorithms that allow us to simulate chemical systems, for example. And so a quantum device will potentially unlock for us humanity, a way to solve new problems that we have not thought of before. Now, what do we do in the Quantum Solutions Lab? We work closely with customers. As I said, we're part of professional services, something that is very important to me. And in that area, we try to identify use cases, currently with a focus on optimization, chemistry, and materials. Optimization is likely right now the most popular use case that we see in quantum technologies. However, it doesn't end there. There's many other problems where we can leverage quantum phenomena to actually find better solutions to some of your industry problems. And more importantly, you might have heard of quantum computers that are currently in the market. We need to distinguish between noisy intermediate scale devices. These are the ones that we exist today. They are noisy, they are experimental devices and what we call fault-tolerant or, or, or error-corrected quantum devices. These will come in the future. They require very complex error correction schemes, and for that you need many, many more qubits. But once we have those error-corrected devices, we'll be able to unlock some really fascinating use cases. So let me give you an overview of quantum efforts at AWS. Our quantum program is structured in three main pillars, three or four, depending how you count. On the left-hand side, you have Amazon Bracket. It's a fully managed service in general availability that allows you to access quantum backends in the cloud. We have connected actual quantum devices to AWS's cloud to allow you to architect in the environment that you feel most comfortable in to try and experiment with some of these experimental devices. On the right-hand side, we have our Center for Quantum Technologies. In reality, it's two centers. We have a Center for Quantum Computing, where we're building our own quantum hardware. But we also have a Center for Quantum Networking, where we are developing novel encrypted, quantum secure encrypted ways of transfer data from your data centers to the cloud. And in the center is the Quantum Solutions Lab that I lead. We are basically the glue between you and what AWS has to offer. Given quantum's nascency, it will take some hand-holding in the time being, and because of that, we are there to help. So let me dive a little bit into some more details and tell you a little bit more about Amazon Bracket. Currently, in Bracket, we house five different devices, 
And I also like to use this slide to give you a very brief and very, very high level technology overview of these machines. On the left hand side, underlined by an orange line, you have so called digital programmable devices. These are devices where you can actually write some simple code in an SDK and then ex execute this code to do some kind of quantum computation. They are, however, noisy in that, again, error correction schemes cannot be implemented yet simply because the number of quantum bits is just not large enough. We house three different technologies. On the left-hand side, you have an ion trap by IonQ. This is actually a tabletop device, not that really impressive chandelier you often see in, in uh, the press. But the wild thing is that you have individual ions trapped with laser traps in space and by manipulating these ions, you can then create quantum gates, similar to the classical gates you have on a classical computer, and perform computations. In the center, you have a superconducting device by Rigetti. The chip is actually just this tiny little blue thing in the center, to give an idea. And this is the thing that you mount onto this giant chandelier that you have seen. These chips need to be cooled to almost absolute zero. And the reason why several companies, including AWS, are investing in superconducting systems is because you build those on wafers. And we have a ton of experience of building hardware on wafers. So this allows us to scale much faster than, for example, an ion trap. I mean, just imagine the logistics of having to grab one atom and moving it around. Just one. That's highly non-trivial. Not to mention that if you kick it, that was it. And on the right-hand side, we have a device by Oxford Quantum Computing. It's an experimental machine, considerably smaller. It is also superconducting, but it uses a very different way of addressing these qubits. Because you see, you might have heard, quantum states are extremely fragile. Now imagine trying to manipulate a piece of china without touching it. Okay? You want to move it around and do things with it, but you're not allowed to touch it. How are you going to do this without breaking it? This is the challenge that we face in quantum physics. We have to be able to prepare a state, manipulate a state, without perturbing it. And this makes it very hard. Again, these are digital programmable devices. On the right-hand side, you have special purpose machines. The emphasis here should be in special purpose. These are devices that have been built with one task and one task only. Okay? On the left side, you have a photonic chip of Xanadu. This is a light-based machine. It allows you to do what is called boson sampling, which can be leveraged, for example, for quantum machine learning applications. Don't get too excited. We're not going to see this anytime soon in SageMaker. Okay? We're still very early. And on the right-hand side, you have a really interesting um, device by one of our partners, Qera, that uses so-called Rydberg atoms. In this device, you have 300 and something atoms that you again can manipulate with optical tweezers and use to solve optimization problems, but also to simulate states of matter. If you want to understand how a particular material works, you could, in principle, construct a virtual version of it. Now, all these, as I said before, are available today. Our services in GA, fully managed. You have access to simulators in case you don't want to experiment before you run it on the actual quantum hardware. You can do hybrid managed jobs where you can combine different quantum machines and classical workloads to build hybrid solutions. I'll get back to this later. This is likely the best way we'll be able to scale these machines. And you'll have pulse control, integration of libraries, etc., etc. Now let me move to the Center for Quantum Technologies. And here, I'd like to focus first on our in-house built hardware. What you see here is the mounting plate on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, we have the building of the Center for Quantum Computing that is housed at Caltech. It is important for us to be as close as possible to cutting-edge science, because like that, we want to cross-pollinate between industry and science and bring the latest technology to our hardware. What you see on the, si on the right-hand side, again, is this mounting plate. Inside of that is our quantum chip. We're building, as I said before, superconducting chips, except with a twist. And to put it in very oversimplified terms, once we have these fault-tolerant chips, we will use chips that are attached to a tiny little heat bath. Okay? And the idea is that you can suck noise out of this, this qubit 
so that you stabilize it by coupling it to this bath. So it's a really clever, very, very different technology than the typical qubits that allows us to correct at least one type of errors very, very effectively. In Boston, we recently opened our Center for Quantum Networking. This is a new center that we have created where we're developing both hardware and software as well as applications for quantum networking. Initially, we're offering connecting external data centers to the cloud for quantum key distribution systems. The idea is to create a quantum secure environment such that you can transfer, for example, encryption keys between your data center and the cloud without the ability for anyone to eavesdrop. Because the second you observe a quantum state, it collapses. And maybe at the end in the Q&A I can tell you about the Schrodinger cat and how that works. Good. This is very important because if you think about it, to run a compute environment, we need both the machines, but we also need a network. And these two things have to go hand in hand. Now finally, I'd like to talk about the quantum solutions lab that I lead. And we have a very simple mission. Our mission is to prepare you, our customers, for the point where we have scalable quantum computers in place, but at the same time, try to bring value to you today by leveraging adjacent technologies like machine learning, high-performance computing, as well as novel algorithms. Okay? In some sense, it's kind of like saying, take a physicist, have him take a peek at a problem in a different industry, and see if they come up with something clever. You will see that we do. And unfortunately, there's very little cross-mingling between communities, which is why some of the methods we use to simulate physical systems are not really used to study industrial scale problems. So how do we engage? In good old Amazonian way, we always start with you, the customer, and we work backwards from your use case. You have a problem. You think it's very challenging. You don't know how to solve it. You come to us. And then what we do is we run on two tracks. On one hand, we assess the feasibility for a quantum technology to solve this problem in the future, simply because we need machines that are not quite available yet. But we will do a small POC to demonstrate feasibility on currently existing quantum hardware, if that's possible. In parallel, we will take this problem and see if we can solve it for you at scale today better than was possible before. And to cut to the chase, you will see towards the end of the presentation that yes, this is possible. Now, how do engagements work? It's very simple. We usually start with a diagnostics call where we talk to our counterpart on the customer side. You tell us, I really have a really hard time solving this problem. How do I sit all my family members on the dinner table so that they don't fight? It sounds trivial. But if you have 10,000 family members, it gets really complicated, if you see where I'm going. This is a hard combinatorial problem, OK? Now that we know the problem, we schedule a discovery workshop. In this workshop, we sit down with subject experts on your side, as well as the ones on our side, to basically try to see what is the actual problem? How is it mathematically represented? Using the previous analogy, it's basically us inviting the most difficult people on your party to see how we can work out those kinks, you know, with who would you like to sit and with who would you not like to sit. Based on that data, we scope out a project, we do a proposal that tells you how we plan to solve the problem. If you find this is the right approach and you're interested in engaging, then we scope it out financially, create a statement of work, and in professional services, you just pay for time and materials. What this means is, if we scope it out for six months, and one of my team members solves this in three weeks, and yes, that has happened, then you only pay for three weeks. It's a great deal if you think about it. Once that's the case, signatures happen, and then we, we do kickoff and start the engagement. Important thing to emphasize here is that all the way until you sign the statement of work, this is free of charge for you. We're happy to work with you and assess the problems that you have to see how we can solve some of the challenging problems that you do. Now, let me take a step back and go back to quantum computing. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about myth versus reality. Now, 
I made an oversimplified slide here, and I'm dividing compute problems for simplicity into two big buckets. Of course, they can be overlapping. On one hand, you have big data problems. On the other hand, you have big compute problems. So let's talk about big data first. In principle, you could solve a big data problem on a quantum computer. The same way that in principle, you could nail a hammer into the wall using a chainsaw. It might not be the best way of doing it, if you see where I'm going with the in principle part. So what is the problem with big data and quantum? This is a nice chart that I adapted from a BCG report. On the horizontal axis, which is kind of a weird axis, you have what I would call speed up potential. On the left-hand side, you have no advantage. Basically, you just have a constant advantage, meaning that your quantum computer does it just five times faster. This is not really impactful because then you can use five times more compute resources and you're back to square one. Unless, of course, this constant is one trillion. Then it's, we're talking another different story here, okay? In the center, you have a polynomial or power law advantage like quadratic speed up. And on the right hand side, you have exponential speed up. Exponential is really the one we're after because it just blows up in speed very quickly classically. But on a quantum machine, you can just solve it in linear time. And when you look at this, I put some random algorithms in there. I'll go through them in a second. And they kind of group into two big buckets. On the bottom right, you have the purebreds. Those are those that are extremely fast, exponential speed up. But they're extremely delicate to noise, which is actually the vertical axis you're looking at. So if you have slightly imperfect quantum hardware, this is just not going to work. In there, we have HHL, for example, allows you to solve systems of linear equations, semi-definite programming, and of course, also Shor's algorithm for factoring numbers that you can use to, for example, break crypto. On the top left, you have the workhorses. These are robust to noise, but they don't give you that much speed up potential compared to the exponential ones. And here we have variation on quantum eigensolvers, QAOA. One is for chemistry, the other one can be used for optimization. We have annealers, you might have heard, for example, of D-Wave's quantum annealer that falls into that bucket. These are machines that work really well, but until today we have not seen really a transformative speed up. And now you see right in the center, there's this one very lonely character that is Grover Search. It's a bit of a problematic one because it is finicky to noise and it only gives you a quadratic speed up. And Grover Search is the algorithm that everybody talks about, about speeding up database searches. And you see that because of that, and paired with the fact that clock speed on quantum machines are in the kilohertz, so relatively slow compared to a classical computer, that we don't have quantum RAM, and that when you actually sit down and implement the algorithm, the overhead can be massive, any kind of polynomial speed up gets washed out. And because of this, Grover Search is definitely not a good way of doing database search. Take home message, we need many more algorithms with exponential speed up out there. Good, so coming back to our list, I would say big data, not gonna happen anytime soon. As a matter of fact, I hopefully will be happily retired. So let's talk about big compute problems. And here, I just took three of the examples you often read in the press, chemistry, crypto, and optimization. So let's talk about chemistry and material science. Let me take this out front. Chemistry is going to be the first high value application, in my opinion, once we have an error corrected quantum computer. Okay, let me show you why. What you see here is a distribution of all the FDA approved molecules as a function of the molecular weight. So if you grab all the drugs that are out there and then you see how heavy they are, then you count how many times has this happened, this is what the distribution looks like. And I don't think I need to convince you that the really interesting bit is roughly between zero and a thousand Daltons, okay? So if you want to do really transformative chemistry for humanity, you need to have a machine that can tackle molecules of that size. If you have a quantum computer with 100 perfect qubits, then you can only tackle the tiny little pink sliver on the bottom left corner. So you would need a machine with at least a thousand perfect qubits to be able to do chemistry that might change how we do medicine today. So we still have quite some way to go for the big chunk. 
Now you might say, well, don't we have today computers with a couple hundred qubits? Not so fast. The problem is the following, and that is that this little picture here represents a qubit. If I want to convert this qubit into an error corrected, a perfect qubit, then I need to use many physical qubits, the ones that you actually have in the machine, to do the error correction. In other words, to protect it, here with a little red hat, you actually need many, many physical qubits. Bad news. Right now, with the noise levels we have, the overhead is at least one in a thousand. So even to be able to do this pink little sliver on the bottom left, you would need a machine with 100,000 qubits. And that's still in the future. I would not despair. We're very getting there very, very quickly with error correcting schemes. I've seen already some prototypes, other companies are doing cool stuff. So this is going to be the first thing of value. Long story short, it's beyond the currently available hardware except via some special simulators for very specific problems. Now, what about breaking crypto? This is probably the one thing that everybody cares about today. Let's assume we have RSA 2048, our current encryption standard. And let's assume we want to break RSA 2048 on currently available quantum hardware. Now, again, if you had a perfect quantum computer that is error corrected, you would need about 4,000 perfect qubits to crack RSA 2048. But because we don't have perfect qubits, we need to somehow do error correction, and then the numbers blow up. And what you see in this bar chart from top to bottom is different algorithm implementations leveraging this imperfect hardware, starting with a first paper in 2012 that required billions of qubits, and then, as you can see, working its way down to the latest estimate being in 2021, requiring, quote unquote, only about 13,000 qubits. Now, you might say, this is great. 13,000 qubits sounds phenomenal. It's not that far away. Except that your computer has to run for 177 days, coherently. So you need to be able to create a quantum state that stays put for 177 days. Good luck. So where I'm going with this, our data are safe, not only this, we have post-quantum crypto schemes, we're creating quantum networking solutions for you, so don't worry about crypto. That's likely the least thing you should worry about when it comes to quantum. So again, beyond the currently available hardware. So what about optimization? And as you will see in the next slides, where I'll show you a little bit of an example, how we engage, it will work really well for some use cases, and in others, it will not work well at all. So let me show you an example, very, very simple one mathematically, and don't worry, you will not see equations. Well, one, but it's kind of like high level easy, which is portfolio optimization in finance. I'm tempted to say that most of us in this room have some stock and some investments. And of course, you don't want to hold on to stock from all tech companies only, because if the tech industry tanks, up for a bit, then your portfolio crashes. Okay, so you want to diversify, you want to invest in real estate, you want to invest in automotive, energy, etc., etc. You want to diversify. But when you diversify, then your yield might not be as large as when you focus on the big ticket ones that are more risky. And for that, you need to find a balance between these stocks, such that at the end of the day, you get the maximum yield with the minimum risk. That's the problem. So how do we do this in our team? Well, there's the problem, portfolio optimization. First things first, we sit down and think, what does a mathematical representation look like? And it turns out that for the simplest model, so-called Markowitz model, it is simply described by that very simple looking equation up there. Don't worry, I will not bother you with the details. And then you have some additional constraints that you have to fold in. So for example, there might be time-dependent constraints, cardinality constraints, or you might want to exclude certain stocks, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that has to be all folded into the math. Once you have written down your final equation, then you have to choose something to actually solve, the, solve this equation. And there's different ways. You can use, say, a quantum annealer like D-Wave. You can use... Uh, Specialized so called Cubo solver by Alpha Cubo, you can use Gurobi, one of the industry standards in optimization, or even Ion Q's Ion Trap machine if you want to look at three stocks. Okay? Once you have done this, you get your result. 
Now, the really important and key aspect in this slide is this purple box here, which is the mathematical modeling. Because if you do this right, not only can you solve it on a quantum machine, but you might potentially be able to solve it on classical hardware, on standard HPC infrastructure at AWS at scale today. And so in some sense, you're future proving your problem. You're able to tackle it today on HPC, and once the quantum hardware catches up, you just flick a switch. You change one line of code in your cloud setup, and you're good to go. Okay? That is the goal. This is what we try to do with our customers. So let me dive a tiny itty bitty bit into the math of the problem. What you see here is some fictitious set of stocks. A could be Amazon, for example. Okay? Choose whatever you want on this picture. The point is, when you have a selection of stocks, you have to make two choices, buy or not buy. So for each of these, you have two options, yes or no, basically, binary. Now, these stocks are correlated. So for example, A and W might be highly correlated because they are from the exact same industry vertical. And because of that, I'm drawing a line connecting them. This means that if A goes down, W goes down. If A goes up, W goes up. And as you can imagine, this is a very simple toy example here, okay? The idea is really to just visualize what happens. So you can sit down now and write this graph that connects your different stocks in your portfolio. And if you have a simple case of eight stocks like you see here, you have two options to the eighth. So in other words, 256 ways of choosing what you want to buy or not buy. In reality, you have between 1,000 and 10,000 stocks in your portfolio, which means you have at least two to the 1,000 options to search through. You see where this is going, right? It's getting really complicated. Now, mathematically, it's actually really simple to tackle this because all you have to do is look at the graph and find what mathematicians call the maximum independent set. In other words, the maximum set of stocks that are not correlated. In other words, find a set on this graph of dots where one dot doesn't touch another dot. So for example, if I pick H, I'm, on the bottom right, I'm not allowed to pick C or S or W because they're correlated. But I can, for example, pick Y, N, and A. You see? And like that, you can relatively quickly find these options. Now, how do you solve this? You can encode this, for example, in the QRA device, run the anneal, and it will tell you then what this independent set is, in other words, which stocks you should invest to. But what we can do now, if you want to tackle a giant problem that doesn't fit on a quantum machine, is use graph neural networks that we have pioneered in optimization in our team to actually solve the same problem with a billion variables, if you would want so. And so you see now, we found a mathematical model that we can use to run on a quantum device, but we can scale up to billions of variables on currently existing hardware. Good. We also made a little tool to visualize this. Just a quick show and tell here. Of course, you want to really do this with real world data. So we wrote a small little web interface. It will take data from Yahoo Finance. You can choose which stocks. You can choose which time windows. You can choose which constraints. Then you can choose which backends you want to use. If you want to run on a quantum device, a classical solver, HPC infrastructure, press Enter. And then it will give you your risk versus return. You might say, well, why would you care about that? For two main reasons. Number one, you want to see what quantum can do versus classical. You want to compare with real data and not some synthetic example. But more importantly, sometimes one will give a solution that is more appealing to you than the other. A simple example, you'd rather hold on to more Amazon stock, even though it might not be clever to do at this point in time. And so you might choose the other solution that has more Amazon stock in the bucket but is optimal for that particular constraint. Good. But is, as you can see now, this problem, perfect, easy to solve on a quantum machine. It's natively possible to put this on a quantum device. What about other problems? Or is optimization always a use case, a good use case? Well, this is where it gets hairy, because the real world has other problems that are very, very different in their mathematical nature. And one of them to hear a lot is vehicle routing. So the simple fact is, remember at the very beginning I said, a quantum computer 
is a machine that leverages physics for physics problems in some sense that we are repurposing for other applications. And because of that, a quantum machine will only understand a mathematical equation called a cubo. Remember that simple equation I showed you earlier, the QIJ is ISJ? That's the only input that this machine takes. So if your problem looks very different mathematically, you have to somehow bend it so that you can put it in this mathematical form so that the quantum device can understand it. Let's take vehicle routing, the bread and butter of Amazon. Well, let's take a simple route with 50 stocks and not even consider the fact that there are constraints like no left turns, driver breaks, business hours, etc. Let's just say, okay, it doesn't matter, we can deliver any time, just connect the 50 dots in the shortest route. If you look at the native search space for this problem, we're talking to about 10 to the 64 possible solutions, or possible routes, pardon, not solutions. But if you now convert this to this quadratic form to run on a quantum machine, you're looking at 10 to the 752. So you went from something that was unmanageable to something that you don't even want to think about. And that is the challenge. Every time you change the mathematical formulation, you might incur an overhead. And because of this, some quantum applications are better, sorry, some industry applications are better suited for quantum devices than others. And this is where we, the Quantum Solution Lab, come in to help you. Good, so let's go from POC to production. We talk to a lot of customers of pretty much every single industry vertical. We get thrown at some of the most incredible problems, both challenging, some even funny, but all of them have one thing in common. Our customers don't know how to solve them, okay? And so I compiled a very, very simple and very, very incomplete laundry list of problems and how we think it might be best to solve them today and their potential to solve them on a quantum device tomorrow. And so I just picked four industry verticals, manufacturing, logistics, chemistry, and finance. And you see that there are these little cubes that are color-coded. A black cube means don't do it. A red cube means you just leverage high-performance compute. In other words, toss as many CPUs on it as you can. A salmon-colored cube means this is a good problem to solve with machine learning. <clears throat> a white cube means you can eventually run this on a quantum computer very effectively without incurring a massive overhead. And the little purple one on the right-hand side is use either traditional operations research tools that are well established, or some of these what we call nature-inspired algorithms that we develop on the team. Now, what is a nature-inspired algorithm? I'm tempted to bet that most of you have heard the term genetic algorithm. It's very simple. You make a pool of candidate solutions. Some might work, some might not. Then you check them to see how well they work. And those that don't work well at all, you just kill off and you respawn new solutions from the ones that you have. If you think about it, it's a beautiful evolutionary approach. You start with a pool of unfit fe uh, fellows and at some point you have survival of the fittest. And that usually settles in the optimum, ideally, okay? That's one genetic algorithm, but uh, one uh, nature-inspired algorithm, but there's many more. There are annealing methods that are similar to what you do in metallurgy, where you heat up a material and you cool it down slowly to remove imperfections. There are particle swarm algorithms. There's a whole zoo out there that you can use. And those are the methods that often are not known outside of physics. And this is exactly what we want to bring to you, our customers. So let me go through the list, manufacturing, job shop scheduling, how do you get it? You get orders into your factory, how do you assign the machines and workforce? It's a problem that you can pretty much solved with many different approaches, as you can see. Same thing for factory line optimization. In other words, for example, if you want to paint cars, how do you sort your cars? How about robot motion planning? You want to, say, move a robot around the vehicle. How do you do this? And I'll show you an example in a sec. Predictive maintenance, traditional ML workload. In chemistry and simulations, as you can see, every single box is white. Because as I said, a quantum machine is designed to leverage quantum phenomena, and chemistry and materials is nothing else than quantum mechanics. So those are very well suited to be solved with future quantum devices. 
What about logistics, transportation, and routing? As you can see, it's pretty bleak with a quantum machine. And this is mostly because of this massive overhead that you have when you, com when you com um, convert any routing type problem into this form that the hardware will understand. And typically, you solve this either with some of the algorithms we develop or operations research or machine learning techniques, although machine learning might not be optimal for many cases. And then finally, finance. Interestingly, there's a lot of interest in quantum and finance. And so there, we've been looking at many problems where you can show that a quantum machine will show some value. So what can we do? Well, first of all, we need to find more use cases for these future error-corrected computers. This is why we like to talk to you, because at the end of the day, we want to build something that is useful to our customers. But we also want to leverage our insights, especially in quantum physics, and use them to solve some of the most challenging problems today without the quantum computer. In other words, think about emulating a physics process on an HPC system and leveraging this for, for example, optimization or simulation. And that's what we do on the team. So I'll show you in the next couple of slides some of the use cases in different industry verticals that we've looked at, just to give an idea of what we can do. The first one was done with BMW in its robot motion planning. As you can see in the video, you have four robots dancing around a car body from a BMW, spraying PVC sealant. And notice that there's thin nozzles. There are also nozzles that spray, like this one, in a very wide pattern. And so the problem is relatively simple to write down. Find the shortest path that makes sure that you have sprayed all the seams in the shortest amount of time with the right amount of material without bumping into other robots or bumping into the vehicle. It's simple to explain in words, but now imagine what this means mathematically, because a robot can have a seam direction you spray, it can have four different nozzles, it can have three different nozzle configurations, and even worse, you need to discretize the space volume where the thing is actually moving. That is your solution space you have to tackle. So how do we do? We first converted this to this cubo, this form that a quantum device will understand, and we went ahead and solved it with a hybrid quantum approach, but we quickly ran out of oomph at about 30 seams, which is not even the smallest vehicle that BMW offers, just because the complexity was so high. And so my team came up with this very clever idea that we leverage from middle mile optimization called the random key optimizer. It's a novel type algorithm. And the novelty was that we took this random key optimizer and paired it with an annealing algorithm from physics. By doing this, we were able to improve the robot's runtime by 10%. Now, this might not sound like a lot, but if you do the math and think how many vehicles BMW makes every day, and then scale up this 10%, this can be savings in the billions. And so you can see how by combining algorithms and leveraging insights from physics, we were able to solve a problem that BMW had been struggling with for almost a decade. Let me show you a next use case we looked at, this one with the Volkswagen Group. It's a so-called binary paint shop problem. You have vehicles in your production line. They have to be painted. The order Oops, sorry. The orders keep coming in. And then the goal is to switch the paint as little as possible, because every time there's going to be delays and wasted material. In the, top, on the, sorry, in the center row on the panel, you see that we have three paint switches. But if we slightly rearrange the vehicles, you only have two paint switches. You might say, well, why don't you just wait for a long, 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 long time, and then just paint all the red ones and then all the blue ones? Well, because people want their cars. They don't want to wait until all the red ones are done. So how do we look at this? We first did a very simple proof of concept using an algorithm called QAOA that runs on IonQ's Ion Trap hardware for a tiny little problem with a handful of vehicles just to show that it's feasible. But then we took the exact mathematical representation and scaled it up to a million variables solving the problem using graph neural networks. And so you see how now we found a mathematical representation that will run on a quantum device 
but we can solve today if we want for a billion vehicles, although I don't think they make that many at once. Next one is really interesting. This is options pricing. Options are financial products that several of the large banks offer. And options pricing is represented by what is known as a stochastic differential equation. It's a type of mathematical equation that describes how the stock will move coupled to a noise term. Because you see, humans are erratic, they buy, they sell. So it's not just a smooth evolution, but as you look at the stock, you see that it does these random jumps up and down, although there's some kind of overall trend to it. And that overall trend is described by the rest of the equation. Now, these stocks are correlated. So if one is fluctuating and then dumps, it might drag another one down with it. So now you have a set of multiple equations that are correlated with noise terms. And the way that you typically solve this for a tiny little problem in mathematics is with a so-called Fourier transform. Okay? Then you have a simpler equation to solve, bam, you're done. The problem is it won't work. When you have a lot of coupled equations and you want to do a Fourier transform, the space over where you have to sum grows exponentially large. It's extremely hard to actually sum over all the points in space. So if you say you have 100 stocks and you have sum over 100 points, you can do the math. Now if you have a million points, you can do the math. Okay? So what do banks do? They use Monte Carlo simulations. Basically, they approximate equation. So they will just pretend this random motion is produced by some random process, see where it lands. Now, of course, that's not representative. Then you have to repeat the same calculation a billion times so that these fluctuations wash out, and then you see the overall trend of the curve. Emphasis here is on a billion times. You use a lot of CPU. In fact, some of the largest um, workloads in compute in this planet are simulations for options pricing. Now you might say, well, why does a bank want to do this? Because it's a really fail-safe type of investment that is very lucrative for them, so they want to toss as much CPU on it as possible. So what we did first is we said, well, if we had a theoretical perfect quantum computer and we wanted to use a method called quantum amplitude estimation, how many quantum bits would it take? How many gate operations? So we did a so-called theoretical resource estimate. This is not very useful because you just say, look, it's going to be bad news. You're going to need 1,000 qubits just to do a tiny problem, for example. But then the folks on my team sat down and thought about this. I think everybody has heard TensorFlow. There's a word tensor in there, right? This is this high dimensional mathematical thing. And so the, the thing that you have in machine learning and that you happen also here when you do these Fourier transforms is that you have a very high dimensional space that you somehow need to squish down to the places where it matters, putting it in very oversimplified terms. Tensor methods were actually invented in physics and now are being used in machine learning applications, and they were invented to simulate quantum systems where your space grows exponentially with a number of qubits. And so what we did is we said, well, if tensor networks can simulate a quantum system and squash a high dimensional space to something more manageable, why cannot we do this with one of these stochastic differential equations? And it turns out it works. So for example, for European options, which is the little chart you see on the bottom, you get about the same scaling with a tensor network, but you get a million-fold speed up over Monte Carlo. In a million-fold, remember we talk about these constants, that's a sizable amount. If you have to use a million less compute to solve the same problem, that's going to save you a pretty dollar. We also tested it in other financial products like European options. There's other SBRs and all kinds of products. The point is it works. And now you see how even though an actual quantum machine might be hard to solve this problem, we came up with a way that allows you to solve this problem faster than anyone was able to do before, leveraging ideas and technologies from quantum computing. The last use case I want to tell you about is fraud detection. If you look at how fraud detection is done today, it's typically tabulated data where you use machine learning to find outliers and patterns. But if you think about it, financial data or, or say purchases, for example, 
they're inherently graph-based data. What do I mean by that? If, for example, I go shopping, I do all my shopping, say, at Whole Foods, when I go to the grocery store and all my online shopping at Amazon.com, but suddenly I decide to buy flowers in Europe, that's obviously something very suspicious. So if you were to now cluster all my purchases, you would see these blobs, right? Helmut likes to buy electronics, shoes, whatever else on Amazon.com and all the groceries on Whole Foods. So you have these lumps of interconnected dots because they all relate to each other. But then you have this one thing, the flowers in Europe. Something's fishy with that. And so what you can do now is you can analyze the graph structure of this graph. Okay? You see a simple example on the bottom left. We did a small scale POC levering actually a quantum machine. And for example, in that particular graph, you can see that there's four distinct communities. You can also see that sometimes it's not easy to determine who is part of which community. You know, there's these edge cases. But I think it's pretty clear that, for example, the green ones are outliers. There's no question about that. So now you just need to use Amazon Fraud Detector, score the data, and it will tell you right away all these green purchases, in other words, flowers in Europe, were likely fraudulent. Damn, you're done. Now, what's the cool thing about this? The mathematical equation describing this process runs natively in a quantum machine. So we can run this on a quantum computer. But we can also solve the exact same graph-based problem with graph neural networks at scale today in AWS. And so now, instead of looking at tabulated data for fraud detection, you can do graph-based fraud detection, levering a mathematical form that at some point will let you run the problem on quantum hardware. With this, I'd like to switch gears very briefly and tell you about this crowd science challenge that we launched with BMW. What was it? It was called the BMW Quantum Computing Challenge. The idea was to discover quantum computing solutions for some of BMW's more challenging problems and then to actually test these submissions, these solution approaches, on actual quantum devices hosted in AWS. So how did this work? We, the Quantum Solutions Lab, set together with BMW, we looked at several of the problems that they have in the plant that are really hard and challenging. And from there, we identified a subset of them where we felt this might be a good fit for quantum. We narrowed it down to four main problems. One is pre-production vehicle configuration. What does this mean? When a car manufacturer wants to make a new vehicle, they need to run tests. You know, if I turn on the blinker and I turn on the radio, does the car work? If you see where I'm going with this, right? If I open the windows and the trunk at the same time, will the car start? I know this sounds a bit ridiculous, but these are the so-called verification validation problems that are extremely painful to solve. And even worse, there's some tests that are destructive, because at some point you've got to crash the vehicle against the wall. So what is the challenge? You want to build the minimal amount of vehicles such that you can run all your tests because building this custom one-off vehicles is very expensive. So you can do the math how challenging that is. That was one. The other one was looking at material deformations. You know, when the presses stamp out a door, sometimes you'll see creases. And the idea was, can we use quantum machine learning techniques to detect these creases on simplified synthetic data? Next one is relatively straightforward. When you have a more modern vehicle, it has sensors everywhere, okay? From LiDAR to radar to optical, et cetera, et cetera. And regulators require, for example, that a particular place in space is covered by at least two sensors of certain kinds. And so the question is, since every sensor has a specific like cone where it detects, how do you place these sensors on an actual body frame, so not just on a rectangular box, such that the space that regulators want you to cover is covered, but you don't add as much sensors as possible to cover it. You add the minimal amount. Again, think about geometry, the problem, really complicated. And at the end, we looked also at quantum machine learning for quality assessment, making sure that things are running well. Good. We ran this challenge, we got 70 Seven zero good solid submissions, somewhere 140 pages long. We need to add a page limit next time. From there, we choose 16 finalists and then four winners. 
Now, why was this important? It was important because all 16 finalists got to present their work. And I have to tell you that some of the solution approaches we would have never thought of. And this is really what I want to encourage you. This is my call to action to you today. You know, quantum physics might be this weird thing that is hard to understand, but putting a fresh pair of eyes on a problem and looking at it from a different angle can often unlock solutions that we never thought of before. So again, let's launch a challenge together. With this, I'd like to end. I think it's the right time to explore quantum applications. Why? We need to understand what we can do with these machines when we start building them at scale. And we also need to understand which problems will benefit greatly from quantum hardware. Where can we deliver value to you today? Where can we do this tomorrow with an actual scalable machine? We need to co-create. We are not experts in every discipline. So we need your help, your subject matter experts to work with us to come up with creative solutions. But we also need to focus on these quantum challenges where we really bring in a fresh breath of ideas. And finally, the goal is simple. We need to build a use case portfolio. Think about it. You do not want to build a tool and then say, well, what can I do with this? You want to start by thinking, what is my problem? Let's make sure we build the right tool for that. But more importantly, this is very dear to me, we need to stop cutting through the hype. We need to start cutting through the hype. There's too much that's being claimed that quantum machines can do that is just not true. And so for me, it's very important to be this voice of reason. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>